If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3 here in just a few moments. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Great section dealing with unity. Unity is something we all desire. We strive for that we want. But do we truly understand it? The definition of unity is the idea of the state of being one. Oneness, concord, conjunction, agreement, uniformity, as unity of doctrine, according to Webster in his dictionary. So we understand unity denotes oneness. It denotes agreement. And I am reminded of that passage in the Old Testament in the book of Amos. Amos chapter 3, verse 3, Can two walk together except they be agreed? That implies unity, agreement, one with another. Unity is desirable. In fact, the psalmist describes unity thusly in Psalm 133 in verse number 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity is good, but not just good, as the psalmist talks about here. It is pleasant. It is a blessing. But further, Christ himself prayed for unity in John chapter 20, in verses 20 and 21. When he prayed, neither pray I for these alone, and again the context is he's speaking of his disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And that word would be the gospel that they would begin preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Many are they who claim that Jesus' prayer has not been answered. How foolish it is for men to say that our Lord, our Savior, God in the flesh, did not have his prayer heard and answered. Because it was answered on the day of Pentecost. And it is still answered when the gospel is preached and when individuals obey it and are added by the Lord himself to his church. They are united into the one body through immersion into Christ in order to obtain forgiveness of sins. When we obey the gospel, when we put Christ on in baptism, we become a member of His body, which is the church. And it is a good and pleasant thing to enjoy as we do here. And as many faithful brethren do throughout the world. Unity is desirable. It is attainable. But how is it determined? Who determines unity? Is it us as mere men or God? Well, the answer is obvious. You look at verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians chapter 4, and you see unity as God has designed it. God's platform for unity, as I've preached before, the seven ones. You have one body, which is unity of organization. Christ doesn't have more than one body. He does not have bodies. Remember the question that Paul asked the Corinthians, is Christ divided? And the answer is no. Religious division is the result of man. Man is the author of confusion, not God. When we get back to the Bible, when we adhere, when we apply properly the New Testament scriptures, unity will be the result. We need to understand, first and foremost, there's only one body. There's only one church. There is one spirit that is unity in life. There is one hope which is unity and desire and expectation, and that one hope is the hope of eternal life. There is one Lord. This speaks of unity and authority, and that Lord is Christ Jesus. There is one faith that is unity and message, and it is described as the faith in Jude 3. There is one baptism. And this gets many folk in an uproar, does it not, when you talk about baptism? The essentiality of baptism? But this is unity in practice. 
And indeed, Christ emphasized the essentiality of baptism, did he not? In Mark 16, 16, when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And did not God inspire Peter to write in 1 Peter 3, verse 21? I'm finally alluding to it, Dusty. You, you got on me about it this morning. 1 Peter 3, 21, where it says, Baptism doth also now save us. It's the baptism Christ ordered that is this one baptism. And ultimately, there's one God and Father and that is unity and worship. That's how unity, unity is determined. That's God's platform for unity. Now what's the, de the demands of unity? What does unity demand of you and I? And, and, and here we come now to Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Where Paul writes, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There are several things we can learn from these three verses. Scriptural unity demands that you and I as Christians walk the worthy walk. We have been called by the gospel into the marvelous light of Christ. To walk the worthy walk is to walk Christ-like in this present world. To live like Christ. To conduct ourselves like Christ. And we do that by patterning our lives after Christ, who left us a perfect example. And as we think about this demand, in verse 3, we are, we are exhorted to endeavor. That is, each of us as Christians must hasten or give diligence. We must exert ourselves to keeping, that is, maintaining and preserving unity. Well, how do we do it? The answer is in the bond of peace. And we understand peace has its limitations. It involves the worthy walk, and work, walking worthy do, does not mean that we do not co that we compromise biblical truth. We cannot do that. Unity, though, is limited to those who are in Christ, in His church, and to those striving diligently to walk in the light as He is in the light. But we also understand that in matters of judgment, that is, matters of opinion, matters of liberty that we forbear one another, that we do not take matters of opinion and make them matters of obligation or matters of salvation. In Romans chapter 14 is a chapter which deals with this matter, which discusses matters of liberty in more detail. We understand that unity is separate, is impossible, excuse me, separate and apart from God, from Christ, the Word, and the church. But we must add, we must consider that, that you can't spell unity without the, without the letters U and I. You see, you and I play a crucial role in this. Not in establishing unity, God does that, but in maintaining unity as brethren. And so it is in this lesson tonight. We want to examine the role that you and I as Christians have in maintaining unity as brethren. In this lesson, we're going to explore the dispositions necessary on our part to maintain and preserve unity, as well as the actions involved. As a result of our study, we are going to demonstrate that just as unity is impossible, separate and apart from God, it is just as impossible to maintain unity without the proper dispositions and actions necessary on our parts. Thus, as Christians, we need to understand that unity cannot be enjoyed without you and I fulfilling our God-given responsibilities as members of the body of Christ in the preservation and con continuation of unity among ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it is as we approach the lesson tonight. First of all, consider with me the dispositions necessary to preserving unity among brethren. And it all begins, number one, with the need to love one another. Sounds so simple, does it, does it not? Love one another. The scriptures are replete with references of, with commands to love one another. The fact that love one for another is emphasized so much throughout the New Testament stresses the seriousness of this great need for, a God, for love. We understand what love is. 
It is the opposite of envy. It is the opposite of hatred. It's the opposite of malice. And those are dispositions which ought not, nor must not be present among ourselves, are they not? Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. Turn with 1 John chapter 4 and let's look at verse number 20 and then we're going to read a couple of passages over in 1 John chapter 5. One of the saddest things I've seen in my, my young life, as, not just as a preacher but as a Christian growing up in the church, as I've witnessed growing up outright hatred that brethren have demonstrated one toward another. I've seen brethren come right out and say they hated someone else. Now, is that Christ-like? Now, we may not like the actions that some engage in. We may not like the attitudes of some. We may not like what they do. But does it give us license to just outright hate them? Now, we can hate the actions, but does that give us the right to hate the individual? And the answer is no. And certainly, certainly the Apostle John talks about this here in 1 John 4, verse 20. When he writes, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And the answer is, it's impossible to. If we truly love God, we are going to love one another as brethren in Christ. And this is not just a mushy love, this is agape love. This is 1 Corinthians 13 love. That's the love that we are talking about. Notice verses 2 and 3 of 1 John 5. John writes, By this we know that we love the children of God. Well, how do we know that? What is the evidence for our love, of our love? When we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. They're beneficial. And certainly when we love one another, we are going to benefit from it. Because it's going to show our love for God and love and concern one for another. The song we often sing, How Sweet, How Heavenly is the Sight, emphasizes this truth. Stanza 3 reads, When free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wish is all above, each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love. Then you look at the words to verse number 4. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's an heir of heaven who finds whose bosom glow with love. We must demonstrate the attribute of love in our lives. Remember, God is love. And he demonstrated his love toward us perfectly in sending his son to die for our sins. And if God loved us so much, how much more so should we love him and love the church. And to love the church is to love one another who constitute, who make up the church, having been added by the, church, by the Lord himself to her. A second key disposition necessary is humility. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 talks about being lowly in mind. It's the idea of being poor in spirit. The disposition that Christ talked about there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the disposition to submit to God's will. It's the opposite of pride. But it's also the disposition that allows one not to seek one's own personal gain and glory, but it also looks out for the best interest of others. Lowliness of mind is important. It's essential because it's going to keep us from becoming desirous of vainglory, which in turn produces envy. Galatians 5, verse 26. Humility, this lowliness of mind, not only keeps us from becoming vainglory, from seeking vainglorious things, but it is essential in living Christ-like. Remember, Christ said, That I am meek and lowly in heart. And if my life is to be conformed to the image of the Christ, I too must be meek and lowly in heart. Is it it easy for us to do that? No, it's not, because we're human. 
And certainly the devil is hard at work every day seeking to, to, to lift us up, to, seeking to turn us away from God, seeking to get us to give in to the pride of life. When he does that, we must examine the Scriptures. We must be on guard, examine the Scriptures and apply them. Humility is the key to greatness, not pride. We need to show humility among one another. Not only that, we need to be long-suffering. Again, the same verse there in Ephesians 4, verse 2. And again, long-suffering is the idea of patience. Barnes observes that it is the idea of bearing patiently with the foibles, faults, and infirmities of others. Burton Kaufman has observed, he noted, and I like the quote when I was studying for this lesson, he stated that a Christian who is always uptight about the mistakes of others can create disaster. In fact, he himself is a disaster Think about it this way. God is long-suffering to me. He's long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish. And I understand His long-suffering is salvation. If God is long-suffering to me, should I not be long-suffering with others? That's a good question, is it not? That's a sobering question. Since God is long-suffering with me, how can I afford not to be long-suffering with others? And the answer is, I can't. I must be long-suffering. Closely connected with that, again, we see here in verse number 2, is the idea of forbearing one another. And to forbear is to hold up, to sustain, to bear, or, or to endure. It's closely connected with long-suffering. But this enables us to accept our place with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It also enables us to support one another in the trials of life, in the sense of bearing with each other. It's the concept of bearing with each other's infirmities, knowing how much have been or are still obliged to bear with us. And we're going to talk more about this in in a later point. We forbear one another in love. It's that love which seeks the highest good for another, or seeks that which is best for others. We also must be of the same mind or like-minded one toward another. Paul, in writing to the church at Rome, wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, to be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not the high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. The idea of same mind here in this context refers to our attitude, our disposition and behavior toward others in their lot in life. It is the concept of seeking to understand others. And in this case, it's important we understand one another as brethren, understands our, our, our needs and desires. We're all different, but we can understand one another. We are not to mind the high things. And again, the high things here refers to to those things which carry preeminence, honor, recognition. Our disposition should never be to seek chief seats, not to seek prominence. Such a disposition was manifested by Diotrephes in in 3 John. He, He wanted, he loveth the preeminence. But yet we understand there's only one preeminent being, and that's God, Christ. We must not be wise in our own conceits. We must not think too highly of ourselves as if we are better or if we are superior to others. Now let me stress right here, this is coming from the perspective of a gospel preacher dealing with other preachers myself. I can tell you this, gospel preachers are not immune to such a disposition. I've seen gospel preachers who who thought they're better or superior to, to others. I have seen it firsthand. There's some brethren who will... Some preachers, I've seen it, will treat other brethren. They'll treat some preachers, but they'll treat other brethren as if, well, I know it. I'm superior to you. I'm a preacher, so you, you, know, you need to look up to me. I know it all. And, and, and that's not, that's, that's, there's just something sickening about that attitude, is there not? 
But I have seen preachers, gospel preachers, treat, treat fellow preachers just, you know, downright awful. Perhaps one of the things that, that gets to me, I don't have an axe to grind, and, you know, I'm not using that, but, you know, there are things that, you know, that seemingly that, that just appear to me personally as if they're the case they may not be. You know, some, some people like to look down. Some, I've noticed lar some larger congregations, and I've experienced this before, tend to look down on smaller congregations as if they couldn't do anything. As if they didn't have a right to exist. I've had Christians for, who have attended larger congregations before tell me, where do you attend? How many members you, go, you, you all have? And I've said, and I've said, and then they're like, hmm, well, that's too bad. And I'm like, what do you mean that's too bad? How dare you say that? That's the opposite of the disposition we are talking about. That is the arrogant, that is the condescending, that is the haughty mindset of thinking one is better than others. And that's why the Bible warns we must not think too highly of ourselves. If we're to avoid this, we need to serve one another. The idea of serve obviously is an action, but it's also an attitude. It's the Christ-like disposition. Remember what Christ said there in Matthew 20, verse 28? Came not to, to be served, but to serve. You know, being a member of the church, it's not what can the church do for me. And I'm afraid there's, I've ran into some who've said, what can the church do for me? I've had some who wanted to obey the gospel, but the first thing they asked upon learning what they had to do to be saved and what would occur was, well, what, when, if I do this, what can, the, what can your church do for me? Then I had to tell them that it's not about you. They didn't obey the gospel, but again, what good would it have done them with that, with that disposition? It's not what can, I do, can the church do for me. It's what can I do for the church. What can I do for you? What can I do to help others? And that was the disposition Christ had. And that's the disposition you and I must have. Hence, is it any wonder then, as we consider the actions that are necessary for maintaining unity among, among ourselves as brethren, that not only must we have the attitude to serve, we must do it. Because we are servants of righteousness. We are servants of God, having yielded ourselves as, as instruments of righteousness to, in submitting to the commands of the gospel. And as we live in accordance to the gospel, we continually yield our lives as servants to God. And as we serve God, one way we show our servants service to God is by serving others. Doing good unto others. As Paul talked about in Galatians 6, verse number 10. And as Christians, we serve others. And in this particular context, we serve one another as brethren. Paul, in writing to the churches of Galatia, reminded them that, Brethren, you've been called into liberty, and indeed we have been. We have been freed from the bondage of sin through the blood of the Lamb. But now notice what else he says. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. You, you don't live any way you want to live. You are not guided by fleshly lusts. But by love, serve one another. That's a great challenge, is it not? It's a great challenge to you. It's a great challenge to me. But that's what we must do. Have the disposition to serve and just do it. Not only that, we must edify one another. Twice in the New Testament, this particular phrase is used. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and, and verse number 11. The purpose of such, the purpose of edification is to promote growth in ourselves as Christians. 
It's to build one another up in, in the most holy of faith. Now, how do we accomplish this? How, are you, how can you and I edify one another? How can we ourselves be edified, but in the same act, how can we be busy edifying one another? Well, number, there's three things. And it all involves being together. As you read in the article in the bulletin, it involves a sense of togetherness. Number one, in fellowship. Fellowship's a great spiritual blessing. We should enjoy our fellowship one with another. Christians should should want to spend as much time as possible with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, shouldn't we? Greatest people in the world. We need to spend that time one with another. In fellowship, in worship, as we are accomplishing this day, the Lord's Day. We are being built up as we worship God. As we sing songs of praise, as we study His Word. As we pray and as we observe this morning the Lord's Supper, as we give back of our means, our faith is being strengthened. We are drawing closer to God. But we also do this in working together as laborers together with God. It gives me me encouragement to know, and I think it gives us all encouragement to know that we're all in this together. We're all working together. We're all walking together. We're worshiping together. That's encouraging, that's edifying, that's strengthening my faith. And as we do that, we're provoking one another, we're stirring one another up. And we're going to talk about this here in just a few moments. Unto love, into good works. We must receive one another. Romans chapter 15, verse number 7, Paul writes, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. We do not exclude those from fellowship whom God has received, those who have obeyed the gospel. As Christians, we have no right to exclude those whom God has received. Remember, Diotrephes tried to there in 3 John. He was the church dictator there. We have not the right to exclude based on racial and ethnic differences. But I've seen brethren attempt to do it, and that is a sickening mindset, is it not? That sickens the Lord. There's no place for prejudice in the body of Christ. Prejudice is not a new problem. See how the Jews treated the Samaritans. Especially how... How, 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 how surprised the disciples were when they learned in John 4 that Christ was indeed stopped to talk with the Samaritan woman. They were prejudiced toward the Samaritans. There's no room for that in the kingdom of God. We have not the right to exclude based on racial or ethnic differences, gender differences, social distinctions, economic disparities, and or on personal convictions. That is, in matters of liberty and judgment. However, though, we must warn that we cannot receive those whom God has not. We simply cannot. We receive those whom God has received, but we cannot receive those whom God has not. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, we receive one another. As God has received us. We are to bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6 verse number 2. There's an old song that goes, an old rock song. Came out in the late 60's by the band called the Hollies. And they had a song called, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. As Christians, our, our disposition ought to be as that old song goes. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. You know, we must bear our own burdens as Christians. Verse 5 of Galatians 6 clearly teaches us that. But yet we also recognize that others can aid us in bearing them and we can help one another and we can help others bear their burdens. As Christians, we need to be reminded constantly that we can help one another get to heaven. 
And we, we need to help one another get to heaven. And one way we can help one another ensure heaven as our home in eternity is by helping one another bear, bear, bear their burdens. And they can help us bear our burdens. Bear the load together. a great responsibility but you never know what kind of in effect you're going to have on someone by helping them in times of distress by helping others bear their burdens we may very well keep them from, de- de- from falling away from the Lord that's how important this is let us bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We must speak the truth with one another. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25. Context talks about speaking every man truth with his neighbor. But obviously, who is my neighbor? Well, everyone is my neighbor. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are each other's neighbor. So we must speak the truth with one another. And the reason being, we are members one of another. Members of the same body. The body of Christ. We must be truthful. We also understand as we speak truth with one another, there are times we may need reproof or rebuke. But yet we must accomplish it in love as needed. Further, we must be kind one to another. According to Ephesians 5 verse 32. That is, we treat others as we ourselves desire to be treated. It's the implementation of the golden rule, Matthew 7, verse number 11. That's golden living. And we practice it constantly, especially among our brethren. We show kindness, concern, compassion. We must forgive one another, according to verse 32 as well. When a brother or sister asks for forgiveness, we must have the disposition to forgive. When they ask God for forgiveness, when they pray to God for forgiveness, God will forgive. When they ask God for forgiveness, God forgives. When there's personal offense between brethren, when they ask us if we're the offended for forgiveness, we must be willing to forgive. You see, if we expect forgiveness from God, how can, how can we expect forgiveness from God if we're unwilling to forgive others? And the answer is we cannot. We need to remember the last phrase of this verse. Why forgive? What motivates us to forgive? Well, Paul writes, even as God for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Because we have been forgiven. Because God is faithful. He wants to continue to forgive us. He wants to forgive us when we do wrong. As His people. And He will. We understand that. How can we withhold forgiveness ourselves from up to others when they ask for forgiveness? We'll give an account if we do. We need to exhort one another. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, the context dealing with the example of the Israelites' unbelief and the Hebrews writer warning about about leaving the faith, about departing from God. And the Hebrews writer implores these Hebrew Christians to take heed, according to verse number 12, take heed to themselves lest they be guilty themselves of possessing the heart of unbelief by turning away from God. And therefore, he, t- he, ex- he tells them to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The same phrase, exhort one another, is employed in chapter 10, verse 25. It's the idea of encouraging, exhorting, admonishing. We need to do this for one another. We need to encourage one another always. To do the right thing. And as we do, we consider one another. 
Hebrews 10, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The idea of consider here, according to Thayer, is to fix one's eyes or mind upon. We fix our eyes upon one another by provoking, by stimulating, by stirring one another up to love and to good works. We need to be concerned about one another. And this is where all those dispositions we talked about in our previous point come into play because they all ultimately tie into this idea of consideration. Again, we emphasize that we can help one another go to heaven. As Christians, we are traveling together on the straight and narrow way. We need one another. We need to consider one another. And as we do, we do these things listed here. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Above all, we need to pray for one another. James chapter 5, verse number 16. We're very familiar with the last back half of the verse. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But you notice in the front half, talks about confessing your faults one to another, but also James goes on to write, and pray one for another. You know, we need to spend much time in prayer to God. And as we pray to God, we pray to God prayers of thanksgiving, but also as we pray, we need to pray for one another. Pray for each other as we strive to live the faithful Christian life. When we, whenever we have tough times, whenever we learn of a brother or sister having difficult times, we pray for them that they can overcome their difficult times. When they're sick or afflicted, we pray for them then. We pray for one another then. When, some, when a brother or sister loses a loved one, we comfort them as, only, as we can and we pray for them during their time of bereavement. Part of our prayer should be for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's needed. That's needed in our lives. And that is essential in the local congregation. Let's spend more time in prayer praying for one another. As we mentioned at the outset, we close with the same admonition that it is God who has determined what constitutes unity and it is God who establishes such. However, as we have stressed, you can't spell unity without you and I. You and I have a responsibility in maintaining unity as we have discussed. A lot of times, and I've seen this in my life, division results because of the attitudes and or actions of individuals, sometimes both. You see, you and I can destroy unity if we hate one another, if we hold grudges one toward another, if we are unwilling to forgive one another, if we treat one another despitefully, if we speak evil, evilly one of another, this would also include teaching falsely, or if we become once more like the world. Unity as to whether we enjoy it or not ultimately comes down to this. Are you and I willing simply to do as God has said? If we are, we will maintain it. If we are not, we will not. It's as simple as that. Let us strive to simply do as God has commanded in His holy word. May God bless us as we seek to accomplish this. Tonight, if you're here, you're not a Christian. You can be united in Christ tonight through your obedience to the gospel. Having heard the word, do you believe it? Believe it enough to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Christ, and to be buried with him in that watery grave. To be immersed into him, contacting his cleansing blood by faith. Being added by the Lord to his church, you can enjoy a new life in Christ tonight. Would you do it? However, as a child of God, if you have slipped, if you've fallen away, you need to rededicate your life. We encourage you to do that as well. Repent, confess your sins, pray to God for forgiveness, and as we have stressed, He is faithful to forgive. And He wants to forgive. 
but you have to come to him. The invitation is extended. What will you do? If you need to respond, do it right now as together we stand, as we sing.